Hi, this is Cindy Liu with CHRO Partners, and today we're going to be doing a summary to save you time. And today's summary is going to be on McKinsey's uh, report on the mindset and practices of excellent CEOs. This is a guide on how the best CEOs think and act. So if you're a CEO, of course you're like, I want to read this, but if you're a CHRO or chief people officer, why should you care? Well, in the report, they talked about how just three in five newly appointed CEOs live up to performance expectations in the first 18 months on the job. That's a little startling to me. So as a CHRO, selecting the right CEO and company to work with is a super important part of your personal success. Whether you're at a stage where you're looking for a new opportunity or you are looking for information on how to better coach your existing CEO, or if you're doing succession planning for the CEO. I'm guessing that for most of you, you understand why this is important. So in this 11 page white paper they put together, they talk about uh, which mindsets and practices are proven to make CEOs most effective. In their work, they study thousands of CEOs and their performance. And what they did was basically extract a set of empirical, broadly applicable insights on how excellent CEOs think and act. And finally, they offer a self-assessment guide to help CEOs and those who help support the CEO in looking at what mindset and practices are closely associated with superior CEO performance. And you see in this chart the six different elements of the CEO's job. So they go from corporate strategy, organizational alignment, team processes, board engagement, external stakeholders, and personal working norms. And within these mindsets, there are 18 different practices, and we're gonna go into those in detail now. So under corporate strategy, they talk about focus on beating the odds. And under focus on beating the odds, they have vision, strategy, and resource allocation. Under vision, reframe what winning means. The CEO is ultimately in charge of deciding where the company's going, where, where do they want to be in five, 10, 15 years. And good CEOs take it a step further and they reframe the reference point for success. As an example, instead of a manufacturing aspiring to be, say, number one in the industry, the CEO can broaden that objective to be in, say, the top quartile of the industry. I think that makes sense, right? Because if you think about the GE of old, which is basically, look, if we're not number one or number two in our space, then uh, we will divest that company. And what the authors say is, that it casts key performance measures in a different light by cutting through the biases and social dynamics that can lead to complacency. Under focus on beating the odds, they talk about strategy, make bold moves early. They talked about five bold strategic moves best correlated with success. Number one is resource allocation, two programmatic mergers and acquisitions and divestitures, three capital expenditure, for productivity improvements and differentiated improvements. Of course, some of these only apply to certain industries. They talked about how making one or two bold moves more than doubles the likelihood of rising from the middle quintiles of economic profit to the top quintiles. And making three or more bold moves makes such a rise six times more likely. And that CEOs who make moves earlier in their tenure tend to outperform those who move later. They also talked about how CEOs who are hired externally tend to move with boldness and speed versus those who are promoted from within the organization. And so one tip they had for CEOs who are promoted internally is to ask the question, what would an outsider do? The last practice under focus on beating the odds element is resource allocation and stay active. They start by saying resource allocation isn't just a bold strategic move on its own. It's basically an essential enabler of other strategic moves. They shared a statistic that companies 
that reallocate more than 50% of their capital expenditures among business units over 10 years create 50% more value than the companies that reallocate more slowly. Yet apparently only a third of companies allocate a mere 1% of their capital from year to year. The top performers do something called dynamically reallocating capital from average performers to top performers to ensure the resources are swiftly allocated to where they deliver the most value rather than spread them thinly across businesses and operations. And how for this to work, CEOs must have personal resolve to continually optimize the company's allocation of resources. All right, moving on to the second of the six elements, which is managed performance and health. Under performance and health, they talk about talent, culture, and organizational design. Talent, which is match talent to value, they start this paragraph talking about how successful investors would much rather invest in an average strategy but have great talent versus have a great strategy and have average talent. But that the best CEOs really put equal rigor into both strategy and talent. It's so interesting to me how they talked about how half of senior leaders say that their biggest regret is taking too long to move lesser performers out of important roles or out of their organizations altogether. And we've all been there, right? So in this uh, article, they talked about how good leaders provide CEOs with great leverage and um, that CEOs who tolerate poor performers or bad behavior diminish their own influence. Continuing with talent, match talent to value, one of the areas of concern for CEOs is always asking the same few people who are already overstretched, kind of the same usual suspects, to take on the extra assignments because they trust that these people can get the job done. It seems that the best CEOs really take a methodical approach to matching talent with roles that create the most value for the organization. They talked about once these roles are identified, the CEOs can work with the other executives to see that these roles are managed and increase rigor and are occupied by the right people, and that the best CEOs ensure that the most important roles have a really robust talent pipeline. I'm sure this is not something I have to convince this crowd of CHROs of, but um, the point I'll make on this is that using this kind of CEO research to push on why your organization needs robust talent management is critical. And then secondly, this is not mentioned in the article, but having a robust talent pipeline might mean not just internally, but also having an external succession plan or an external pipeline of talent, because you may not be big enough to afford a bench of resources or you're a growing organization that has not had time to develop that talent. The second practice within the managed performance and health element is culture. Go beyond employee engagement. The authors talk about how employee engagement surveys typically only cover less than 20% of the organization's health elements that are correlated with value creation. And to really evaluate the health of the organization, it takes more than just a typical employee engagement survey. You've got to look at alignment on direction and quality of execution to the ability to learn and adapt. Now, I want to highlight those words because they're different than how we might talk about them in HR. And when you think about talking about performance management, and uh, you can see that the words that the CEO, CEOs are using are different. They go on to say that they found that CEOs who are rigorous at measuring and managing all cultural elements that drive performance more than double their odds that their strategy will be executed. And over the long term, they deliver triple the total return to shareholders. To do this well, they suggest role modeling, storytelling, aligning of formal reinforcements, such as incentives, and investing in skill building. And I think all those things are exactly in line with what good CHROs are trying to do for their organizations. But please note again the language that is used here. The last practice in the managed performance and health element is organizational design combined speed with stability. 
in this section, they talk about agility and how agility is a big buzzword. And th people think that when you have agility, you sacrifice stability for speed. And in fact, they talk about companies that are both fast and stable are nearly three times more likely to rank in the top quartile of organization health versus companies that are fast but lack stable operating discipline. It appears in this article that effective CEOs are proficient at organizational design and know how to pick the parts of their organization that need to be stable and unchanged versus the ones that can adapt quickly to new challenges and opportunities. For example, being able to put out a MVP or minimum viable product. The third of the six elements is putting dynamics ahead of mechanics. And under this category, they have three practices with teamwork, decision-making, management processes. We all know how the top team can strongly influence a company's success. Yet more than half of the senior executives reported that the top team is underperforming and the CEO is often out of touch with this reality. In fact, less than a third of the CEOs report problems with their team. Yet less than a third of employees reported that their company's management processes support achievement of business objectives. And I'll tell you, I think this is such a big part of the burnout that employees are feeling when they don't feel like they're set up for success and you just work and work and work, and yet you don't feel like you're set up for success, that is going to lead to burnout. That was just a Cindy comment, by the way. They talked about why there's this disconnect and how this disconnect is not an intellectual one, but rather a social one. And excellent CEOs acknowledge this reality and counteract it in several different ways. The best CEOs take special care to ensure that their teams are performing strongly as a unit and that they're swift in adjusting team composition, whether it's size, diversity, or capability. And this can involve some hard decisions like removing likable low performers and or disagreeable high performers, as well as elevating people with high potential. And they really prohibit members of the team putting their own interests ahead of the company's needs. The second element within the putting dynamics ahead of mechanics, which is decision-making defend against biases. In this section, they talk about how biases cannot be unlearned and that sometimes CEOs feel that they're immune to these biases because they feel like their good judgment has gotten them where they are today. And that the excellent CEO put processes in place, put processes in place such as preemptively solving for failure modes, sort of a pre-mortem, formally appointing a contrarian, what they call red teams, disregarding past information, so a clean sheet, and taking plan A off the table. So what happens if those plan A options vanish? They also ensure that they have a diverse team which has been shown to improve decision-making quality. And the last practice in the put dynamics ahead of mechanics practice is management processes ensure coherence. Because the CEO will typically delegate management processes to other executives on their team, like the CFO and the CHRO or the CIO. And even though these plans are sensible individually, um, when put together, it can be a clumsy system and add to confusion. An example I think back on is when I was in the consulting world and we had our field COO set basically the budgets with the CFO on each marketplace. And uh, when they would launch a new market, they didn't always consult with HR or the recruiters to find out about the compensation ranges in those markets and just made assumptions, for example, that it was a B market and the compensation ranges would uh, be B market compensation ranges. And that was not always the case. And in this article, they talk about how excellent CEOs don't allow one management process to foil another. They really require executives to coordinate their decision-making and resource assignment to ensure management processes 
reinforce priorities and work together to propel execution and continually refine the strategy. All right, on to the fourth element, which is help directors help the business. Within this element, they talk about three practices, which is effectiveness, relationships, and capabilities. And how the board's mission is to really provide governance and do that on behalf of the shareholders. And that there's lots of research showing that sound corporate governance practices are linked to better performance. Even with all of these upsides, upsides that many CEOs actually regard their boards as a necessary evil. But they talked about how excellent CEOs take steps to boost the quality of the board's advice to management in these ways. They promote a forward-looking agenda. They have agenda calls for the board that go beyond the traditional fiduciary responsibilities beyond the legal regulatory audit compliance risk and performance reporting they will get input on from the board on a broad range of topics such as strategy m a technology culture talent resilience and external communications and being able to get these outside views on these topics can help management without really compromising the executive's authority they also add on that ceos really should make sure that the board and management work on related activities such as reviewing talent and refreshing strategy at the same time of year. The second area within help directors help the business is relationships and think beyond the meeting. So excellent CEOs take the time to develop and maintain a strong relationship with the chair and they have purposeful meetings with individual board members. They establish these relationships and then build trust so that they can clearly define responsibilities between management and the board. And that sometimes there are discussions that are more comfortable one-on-one -on -one than in a larger group. And basically the excellent CEOs, they are good at promoting connections and collaboration between the board and their top executives. The third practice within the board engagement element is capabilities, seek, balance, and development. Excellent CEOs will help their boards by providing input on the board composition. For example, suggesting certain types of experiences, whether it's related to industry, functions, geographies, that enables the board to support the business priorities. I'm hoping this is why we're starting to see more and more CHRO candidates being considered for board seats. They also suggest that CEOs help to improve board effectiveness by ensuring new members complete a really thorough onboarding program and create programs to help the board stay abreast of topics like changing technology, emerging risks, rising competitors, shifting macroeconomic scenarios, and also that first-time board members can benefit from a structured introduction to what it means to be an effective board member. This is something that a CHRO can get actively involved in. In fact, I remember interviewing Lisa Keglovitz, who at the time she was a CHRO for GameStop and how she had done this for new board members. Check out our blog post for that interview. The fifth element, which is center on the long-term why. And under this category, you've got social purpose, interactions, moments of truth. Of course, every CEO needs to understand their company's mission and values, and it needs to be more than a slogan or in the office poster, uh, but rather used to influence decision making and day to day behaviors. They go on to say that excellent CEOs take it a step further and they reinforce and act on corporate purpose, the why, and that this involves not just making money, but also benefiting society. And under social purpose, they look at the big picture. Excellent CEOs spend time thinking about articulating and championing the purpose of their company as it relates to the big picture impact of day-to-day -day business practices. Visible results matter to stakeholders. As an example, they share that 87% of customers said that they will purchase from companies that support issues they care about. And 94% of millennials say they want to use their skills to benefit a cause. Excellent CEOs know that they're going to be held accountable for fulfilling their promises 
and not demonstrating such results isn't really an option today. The second practice within external stakeholders is interactions, prioritize and shape. Excellent CEOs prioritize interaction with external stakeholders. As an example, CEOs of B2B companies will focus on their largest customers or largest potential customers. CEOs of B2C companies might make unannounced visits to their stores and other frontline operations to better understand their customers' experience. They'll also spend time with their top 15 to 20 most intrinsic investors, those who are most knowledgeable and engaged in their business. These CEOs are well-prepared in their communication to the audience that they're talking to, and it's always centered on their company's why. The last practice in external stakeholders is moment of truth. Build resilience ahead of a crisis. Most good CEOs are going to ensure that their companies have an effective operating model, governance structure, and risk culture, but great CEOs and their boards also anticipate major shocks, macroeconomic events, and other potential crises. And we certainly haven't been short of those in the last few years. There's good reason to do this. They talked about how the headlines that carried the word crisis alongside the names of 100 top companies appeared 80% more from 2010 to 2017. Imagine that. Excellent CEOs recognize that most crises follow predictable patterns. With that in mind, they prepare a crisis response playbook that sets out leadership roles, war room configurations, resilience tests, action plans, and in communication approaches. This is an opportunity for them to go on the offensive. The last of the six elements is personal working norms. What only a CEO can do. So easy to become overwhelmed as a CEO. You have so many constituents and there's plenty of research that suggests that many CEOs are lonely and frustrated and disappointed and have irritation and exhaustion. It seems that the excellent CEOs know that it's inevitable, but they take command of their well-being in these ways. And first is to manage time and energy. Sounds like a lot of the CEOs have one or two highly skilled executive assistants and a chief of staff. And this team helps them figure out how they spend their scarce time doing the work that only the CEO can do. And they're very careful to really plot out all aspects of the CEO's meeting, whether it's the agenda, attendees, preparation. Um, and this also includes alone time for the CEO to have the time to reflect and prepare for these meetings. The best CEOs have their office staff help them manage their energy, including scheduling recovery time. So whether it's, you know, with family, friends, exercise reading, or spirituality. And I love the analogy they use in here, which is that when they do this, they ensure that CEOs set a pace they can sustain for a marathon length effort rather than burn out by sprinting over and over. The next practice in personal working norms is leadership model, choose authenticity. They talked about how exemplary CEOs combine the reality of what they ought to do in the role and who they are as human beings. They answer questions like, what legacy do I want to leave? What do I want others to say about me as a leader? What do I stand for? What won't I tolerate? And then the last practice within personal working norms is perspective guard against hubris. It's easy for CEOs to become overconfident. Their confidence and conviction can increase the likelihood that subordinates tend to say only what they want to hear. Excellent CEOs form a small group of trusted colleagues to provide discreet and unfiltered advice, including the kind that hasn't been asked for, but is important to hear. They also stay in touch with how the work is really done. You know, getting out of the boardroom and the ivory tower and getting down to where the work is done and spending time with the rank and file. The benefits of this is not just for the CEO, but imagine how amazing that is for the employees to have that interaction with their CEO. 
The authors talked about how there's many ways to gauge how well a CEO is doing. Value creation is one, but financial measures of CEO excellence have its shortcomings and can be influenced by things that are really out of the CEO's control. For example, what's the quote unquote endowment a CEO inherits? For example, the company's current revenue base, debt levels, and past investments in R&D accounts for 30% of what it enables a company to move from average to top quintile of economic profit. Industry and geography trends can account for 25%. What the authors propose is that the remaining 45% of the CEOs can control what they endeavor to illuminate in their CEO model. The thing they want you to keep in mind is not every CEO is going to be excellent at all 18 responsibilities. In fact, they have yet to meet one that does. But they do want to point out that the best CEOs are quite extraordinary at a few areas. They're pretty able at all others and they're really not challenged in any of these. And of course, the more a CEO excels in, the better the results tend to be. In their article, they have the 18 areas outlined in a self-assessment chart. I've combined this all on one page, so it's a little bit hard to read, but basically they say that um, practices appear in standard type and mindsets appear in italics. My question to you is, are we looking for a purple squirrel? Does this CEO exist? Does someone who's really um, able and not really challenged in any of these areas, right? Do they exist? And especially in a mid-market company where you may not have all of the executive resources and team to help support the CEO in these things, how would they actually accomplish this. Recognizing that there are going to be weaknesses on the team and so how can you as the CHRO ensure that they have the external resources um, that they need to be at least able in all 18 of these areas. I'll close out on this article with the thought that as a CHRO you can have huge impact in the CEO development. Imagine how lonely you feel and imagine the CEO, perhaps they have an inner circle. And to make sure that you're in that inner circle, make sure you're valuable to the CEO. If you see the train heading towards a train wreck, you would stop it. And if you see that your CEO is struggling, perhaps this is a framework that might be helpful to you. And lastly, if you are not involved in our HR mastermind groups or inner circle groups, and you feel that being part of a peer group would help advance both your personal development as well as the productivity of your organization, feel free to reach out or you can go to our website at www.chropartners.com. That's chropartners.com to learn more. Hope to see you at a future meeting.